let's get this event started. Um, Stuart Manning will open the workshop. Thank you all so much for coming. It's lovely to see a room here um, full to celebrate the career, vision, criticisms and opportunities that Bernard has created for many of the people in the room, both in terms of being a voice of uh, reason, a voice of criticism, and for a number of students here, somebody who's been an invaluable part of them building a career, even if sometimes it was telling them that it was not good enough and they had to do much better. So it's wonderful to be able to celebrate Bernard. So we called the conference the Archaeology of Cyprus and the Wider Mediterranean and in honor of A. Bernard Knapp. You hopefully have all read the text that's on the email, but I thought I would just read it out anyway, because it's the approved text that Bernard, of course, had to edit after I wrote it. <laughs> Over more than 40 years, from the late 1970s to the present day, A. Bernard Knapp has become a figure, a key and defining voice in the scholarship on prehistoric Cyprus and the wider Mediterranean. He is the author, co-author or editor of 24 books and numerous articles, book chapters and reviews, including a here is a Perscom, a review of another book that he's working on currently for Basel. Katie and I are looking forward to that with nervous trepidation. Yeah. He's the co-editor of the leading journal of Mediterranean archaeology. One of the other co-editors, John Cherry, it's a great pleasure to have him here in Cyprus as well at, for this event. And he founded that in 1988, which is more or less when I met Bernard in Sydney, when I showed up trying to find out if anybody in Sydney actually did anything interesting in the East Mediterranean. And after a little bit of misdirection in terms of uh, the departments in Sydney, somebody told me that there's a little room under the Fisher Library where a man driving a yellow Volvo was to be found. And that's where you found out about Cyprus and East Mediterranean if you're in Australia at that time, living in Sydney before anybody starts the Melbourne speech at me. <laughs> Notable as a scholar combining ancient Near Eastern textual expertise with a focus on Bronze Age archaeology of Cyprus and the Eastern Mediterranean. He started with a PhD at Berkeley in 1979, which remains often seemingly not very thoroughly read in the Cary Library, I must say, and I've recommended it to at least a couple of students. A re-examination of the interpretation of Cypriot material culture in the MC2 to late Cypriot 1 period in the light of textual data. Bernard has ranged from an early focus, especially on the Bronze Age and issues around Cypriot archaeometallurgy and trade, to take on the entire prehistory of Cyprus from the earliest times in his book, The Archaeology of Cyprus, from earliest prehistory through the Bronze Age, as well as the wider history and archaeology of the prehistoric Mediterranean world and a range of theoretical topics in archaeology as well, from gender through trade through many other things and materiality most recently. Bernard is engaged with maritime archaeology of the East Mediterranean in the last few years, in particular in his 2018 volume, Seafaring and Seafarers in the Bronze Age East Mediterranean, recently out. And in between, he has co-directed two of the most interesting and leading archaeological survey projects. Co-director Michael Given, it's a great pleasure, is here to join us as well today. Sydney Cypress Survey Project, published in 2003, and the Trodos Archaeological Environmental Survey Project, published in 2013. Now, we meet here in Nicosia, which was not the original plan. We were going to meet at Cornell um, at a conference I tried to organize there to honor Bernard, but in some senses, Illness caused this change of venue and, and things, but it's wonderful actually perhaps to be doing this in Cyprus, um, and I think that's a, a good outcome as it turned out. I'd like to particularly thank Lena Cassianidou, who at short notice basically said, we'll host it and we'll put it on here, which was really fabulous. I'd like to thank Lin Dr. Lindy Crew from Kerry, who likewise basically said, well, fine, I, I will help. So it's been impossible to have done this without the, their two help. I'd also like to particularly thank the Department of Antiquities and, and Dr. Marina solomon Iremidu, who has come along on behalf of the department to say hello to Bernard as well. So we begin the evening. I will stress just one factual thing. I've got little posters that say 10, 5, 1, and 0. When it says 10, you've got 10 minutes to go. If you want to have any questions or any comment, you better stop when it says five. When it gets to one, you meant to sit down, and at zero, I will be starting to walk up here to introduce the next person. <laughs> and I will be using my phone, so blame Apple if you think the 30 minutes is not 30 minutes. When the phone goes, that's it. So, <laughs> thank you very much, and we look forward to the talks in a minute. I would like also to welcome you here to the Archaeological Research Unit. Most of you have been here before. Some of you are here for the first time and you have traveled a long way. It was really 
uh, in Greek, we say everything happens for the reason. And although it was meant to be in Cornell, it was meant to be a, an intimate workshop between friends and close collaborators of, of Bernard. Um, we moved it to Cyprus, and I think this really is the best thing that could happen. A lot more people could be here, a lot more people could benefit. People have traveled all the way from Australia. They wouldn't, I don't think they would go to Cornell for <laughs> this. So uh, I'm, I'm really glad that we are hosting it in the unit. Bernard has been, um, a, 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 in many ways, personal and uh, not, a part of this institution. And um, it, it was a pleasure to be able to collaborate with Sturt and with Lindy to have it here. We thought of doing it just before CARI so that people can stay on and watch the CARI workshop, which is on, on um, sun Saturday. And uh, we are all looking forward to uh, listening to the lectures, the discussions, and the coffee breaks, where I'm sure there will be a lot of uh, uh, friends coming together. Uh, what Something that I would like to say is that uh, Stella and I thought that since there's so many of us gathered here today, it might be a nice momentum for Bernard to write a few words in a book. So we have a big black book, not a little black book. And if you'd like to just sign so that uh, he'll know who was here or say something, um, it's, it, it's there just next to the printer. And during one of the coffee breaks, please do um, put something down uh, so that we can all remember who was here. So enjoy the rest of the conference. We will have coffee breaks upstairs after um, coffee breaks for everybody. So um, this is it from me, and I call Lindy to say a few words. Thank you, Lena. I just want to say a few words on behalf of Kari. Bernard, since he moved here a decade ago, I believe, has been a permanent fixture at Kari, not only sitting in the library, doing his research, but breaking time from his research to be really a mentor and a great supporter, particularly of our junior scholars. And Kari is very grateful to that, and also for the time he has served as a Kari trustee. So we're very delighted that Bernard is such a part of our world, and we do actually have his MA thesis now in the Kari Library as well, because Bernard's been able to source that. So you can read the MA and the PhD. And on a personal note, I first came in contact with Bernard academically when I submitted my very first journal article to JMA, straight out of my PhD. And Bernard, with his gentle and encouraging editorial style, <laughs> helped me get that through to publication, for which I am very grateful. It was tough, but it was worth it. So thank you very much, Bernard. I'll hand back now, I'll hand over to Marina, I believe. Thank you. I have a few written words. So hello, everybody. It is with great pleasure that I have accepted, of course, the invitation to attend today's conference and address a few words honoring on behalf of the Department of Antiquities our distinguished professor colleague Bernard Knapp. I see, of course, many familiar faces in this room and an extended, extended list of speakers, distinguished in their own right, which only proves the position Bernard holds amongst scholars of Cypriot archaeology, as well as the appreciation of the academic community holds to his work. We have already heard from the previous speakers uh, achievements uh, during a career spanning over 40 years, and I would not like to be repetitive, but it would nonetheless be an omission on my behalf not to highlight his contribution to the Bronze Age archaeology of, um, of the island of Cyprus and the Eastern Mediterranean, which remain the primary focus of his scientific work. Both his extensive academic as well as his field work have contributed immensely to the study of the period. In particular, his book, The Archaeology of Cyprus from Earliest Prehistory Through the Bronze Age, has been a major contribution and a significant reference tool as it summarizes the archaeology of the prehistory of Cyprus, examining the relative archaeological and documentary records within their regional context. 
his work on models for the socioeconomic organization of the prehistoric societies of Cyprus was also a major contribution. Professor Knapp has been a longtime friend of Cyprus, Bernard, ever since the beginning of his career in the late 70s and has been involved in important field work which the Department of Antiquities gladly supported. In particular, two long-running archaeological survey projects stand out. The Sydney Cyprus survey project from 1992 to 1997 and the Trudos Archaeological and Environmental Survey project from 2000 to 2004, both now published, which provided valuable insights to the north central foothills and mountain area of Trudos for periods spanning millennia. So without further ado, I would like to wrap up this short, very short introduction and allow for the conference as such to commence. Wishing all for productive two days, and I would also like to extend a very warm thank you to Bernard for all his work in Cypriot archaeology and of course his scientific contribution on prehistoric Cyprus. Thank you, you can applaud now. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marina. Thank you very much, Lindy. Thank you very much, Lena. And uh, at this point, we're on time, so we're going well, and we're going to try and keep it that way. <laughs> I would like to welcome our first speaker, who is um, another longtime friend of Cyprus and veteran in the field, and another Australian, which is, of course, a good thing to have, have some in the audience. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Jennifer Webb, who is going to talk about Cyprus' external connections in the prehistoric Bronze Age, refining a maximalist position. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you very much. There we go. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this, this paper um, is an offering which I make with great respect, affection and gratitude to Bernard, not only for his enormous contribution to the archaeology of Cyprus and beyond and his integrity and professionalism, which is surely second to none, but at a personal level for his unfailing readiness to offer his always honest and usually unbridled opinion on my own work over many years. Indeed, what I want to do in the next 25 minutes is to respond to two specific comments which he very appropriately made on a paper of mine which was published last year. This is the title of the paper, and this is part of Bernard's response, with the key words in red. <clears throat> so what was my maximalist position? And what were the specific causes of Bernard's alarm? In brief, I suggest that uh, the north coast of Cyprus, and in particular unexcavated settlements at Vasilia and Lapithos, were active, even proactive, participants in an international trade in raw metals conducted along sea routes which passed between the south coast of Anatolia and the north coast of Cyprus. In the mid-third millennium BC in the case of Vasilia, and the early second millennium BC in the case of Lapithos that they were both exporting Cypriot copper and receiving copper and copper-based artefacts from external sources, as well as bronze, tin, and precious metals. This is on the basis of the lead isotope analysis, which suggests that eight of 10 analyzed early Bronze Age artefacts from Basilia and 47 of 89 uh, sampled Middle Bronze Age artefacts from Lapithos are inconsistent with, the cop with copper of Cypriot origin. I argue that this is most evident at uh, Middle Bronze Age Lapithos, which is also likely to have been uh, a centre of artefact production based, among other things, on the fact that over 1,800 metal items have been recovered by four different expeditions from some 140 tombs at this site. And that the quantity of imported goods on the north coast is considerably greater than previously thought. The number of imports from Crete, the Levant, Anatolia and Egypt for the whole of Cyprus from the beginning of the early Cypriot to the end of Middle Cypriot II has been reported as about 25 or about 40. My count for Middle Bronze Age, Lapithos, Vunus and Kami alone is at least 150. And this is a minimum which does not include 
uh, possible imports, like these one-off objects, and others which I'll show you in a moment, or raw materials like tin. Indeed, tin seems to have been uh, cons considerably more common on the North Coast than previously thought. This is based on recent PXRF analyses by Andreas Haralambus, which show that 49% of 415 artefacts from Middle Bronze Age Lapithos are copper tin, CNSU, sorry, CUSN alloys of one kind or another, with the alloy level set at uh, over one weight percent. And another 19% of the assemblage contains tin at less than one uh, weight percent. So that is, tin is present in at least, in 68% of the sample. And given that there's no tin in Cypriot copper, the even traces of tin have to mean uh, that there has been, there is bronze in the system which is being recycled. And finally, I suggest that this level of engagement in maritime trade and local production must mean that uh, complex inter-regional relationships were in place that enabled North Coast communities to securely acquire copper from ore deposits some 35 kilometres away on the other side of the Pendidactylos. And I discuss in that paper at some length what this procurement network might have looked like and how it might have allowed Lapithos in particular to establish economic, cultural and ideological preeminence within and possibly beyond this network. Now, it is true that this is a contrary position. In the current literature, with several notable exceptions, um, at least one and possibly two of whom are here, Early and Middle Bronze Age Cyprus is described as village-oriented, agrarian, conservative, inward-looking, and only passively engaged, if engaged at all, in external networks. The accepted wisdom is that it was not until the end of the Middle Cypriot and the transition to the Late Bronze Age, around 1750 or 1700 BC, that dynamism emerges and people in Cyprus, and specifically in Eastern and Southern Cyprus, uh, began to form more complex beyond village communities and engage with the outside world. This one-size-fits-all approach denies the possibility of diverse social and economic trajectories across the island, although we have very good evidence uh, that they did exist. We should also note that excavations in other parts of the island are now producing evidence for specialisation in commodity production, which will no doubt mean that we'll have to change our picture of the whole of the Middle Bronze Age, of the whole of Cyprus in the Middle Bronze Age. But for the moment, my focus is on the North Coast. But back to Bernard's two most uh, trenchant criticisms on my paper, or comments, I should say. The first has to do with the wider picture. What, he asks, uh, were the external international trade links of Lapithos? Why might they have wanted Cypriot copper? And why were the Cypriots important, importing foreign objects, or foreign metal objects, uh, and foreign copper? Were they unable to craft such goods themselves? And the second question has to do with timing. When in the Middle Bronze Age do these external connections become apparent at Lapithos? And when does metal start to appear in quantity in the tombs? And the capitals, of course, are in the original. Starting with Bernard's uh, first point, I uh, acknowledge my limited attention to the broader picture. It seems, however, that I'm not uh, alone in this, uh, or rather that it works both ways. A recent uh, overview of uh, Chalcolithic and Bronze Age copper mines, for example, in a major paper on the provenance, use and circulation of metals in Bronze Age Europe, does not include Cyprus, despite the published evidence for the mining of copper sulphide ore at Middle Bronze Age and Bellicou. Elsewhere, a lack of familiarity with Cypriot material culture is evident, as in this 2016 paper, where this knife, which is of a perfectly ordinary Cypriot form from Vunus, is cited as a mid-third millennium spearhead of a type found in the North Aegean. Much more helpful is a recent paper uh, by Massa and Palmisano, where the north coast of Cyprus is recognised as being part of a seaborne network stretching between the Levantine coast and the Aegean basin via the southern Anatolian coast. Importantly, they point out that the identification of this network quote, remains problematic as there is virtually no excavated EBA, MBA coastal site between Yumok Tepe at Mersin in Cilicia um, and Iasos in Caria in the southeast Aegean, as well as very little investigation on the northern coast of Cyprus, end of quote. This map from uh, Massa's PhD shows this more clearly. So there are problems of visibility both on the south coast of Anatolia and on the north coast of Cyprus, which of course has been inaccessible for legal fieldwork since 1974. Moving on, why might external sources have wanted Cypriot copper? Firstly, it is clear that external sources were receiving Cypriot copper. 
Ala Shia is a named source of copper in texts from Mari and hence was a known destination for shipping from the late 19th or early 18th century BC. And lead isotope analysis also suggests the use of Cypriot copper in Crete in the Cyclades and on the Greek mainland in the early Bronze Age at Malia in the 19th century BC and possibly now also on Kos in the Middle Bronze Age. But why did people in the Aegean and the Levant want Cypriot copper when they had access to other sources? Perhaps security of supply was, uh, through multiple sources was important, especially for places like Yumuktepe, where there is extensive evidence for metalworking and also for conflict with other areas of Anatolia. It's also been suggested that a downturn in Aegean copper extraction after the mid-third millennium made Cypriot copper a valuable alternative, assisted by the development of uh, sail-powered ships. And it may also be that Cypriot copper was already valued for its relative purity, as it certainly was in the late Bronze Age. There is, too, now increasing recognition in the literature that metal flow in Mediterranean Europe was not necessarily unilateral from all source to consumer, with each production centre having an exclusive diffusion halo, but far more dynamic, with numerous local and regional producers feeding copper and al copper alloys into the network. We may also be dealing uh, with the outcome of more opportunistic processes, perhaps to go to another one of uh, Massa's maps, the north coast of Cyprus became part of this network because of the nature of the Anatolian coastline between Antalya and Cilicia. The green lines on this map uh, mark coastal areas that would have been difficult to cross on land because of steep cliffs close to the shore. These areas would presumably also have offered few suitable anchorages or at least anchorages linked to accessible settlements. As Stella Domestica has put it, Cyprus was always known to local mariners as a landmark or as a necessary stopover. It may be that for mariners traversing this stretch of the east-west sea lane, the north coast of Cyprus, which for most of the year can be reached from the intervisible coast of Anatolia within a day, was a necessary stopover. And that first Vasilia and then Lapithos took advantage of this to supply passing ships with food, water and copper. Both have suitable anchorages and at Lapithos, Kiparisovuno, the highest peak in the Pentadactylos, serves as a prominent navigational landmark such repeated necessary stopovers may have led to more formal connections. As to why people in Cyprus may have been acquiring copper from external sources, this is based on the identification of objects with lead isotope signatures inconsistent with Cypriot copper, and I know that Bernard has concerns about these. But it's also now indicated by the high level in some objects of lead and zinc shown by Andreas uh, by the compositional analyses, which do not match the chemistry of Cypriot copper ores. There is, however, no question that tin and or bronze and lead were entering Cyprus in the Middle Bronze Age. If the north coast was an entry point for these metals, why not for copper co-traded along these routes? Elsewhere within this trade network, foreign metals are also found in regions that could otherwise have supplied themselves. So if there is non-Cypriot copper at Lapithos, it would not be an unusual phenomenon. It's possible also that it was cheaper for North Coast communities to receive copper from an external source than to get it from the, Trodos, from the other side of the Trodos, and that access uh, to external sources served as security against disruption of internal supplies. I suspect, too, that more of the metal objects from Lapithos are imports than we have realised. That is to say, some at least of the objects with lead isotope ratios inconsistent with Cypriot copper may have reached Cyprus as finished artefacts. These two uh, very robust bronze needles, for example, are of an uh, Anatolian type. Um, thought, when they're very large, robust ones like these uh, examples, thought to have been used for mending nets or sails. And they're completely unlike uh, ordinary needles from Lapithos. <coughs> and these high uh, tin bronze toggle pins from Lapithos are virtually identical to toggle pins found in, at sites in Syria and Lebanon. Are these are the, are the Lapithos examples, are they imports, or are they local imitations? I don't know, but either way, they suggest significant external contacts. Metalsmiths in Cyprus were certainly capable of making their own copy ba copper base artefacts, to respond to another, one, another of Bernard's comments. From the earliest phase of the early Bronze Age, we have uh, metal hoards from Vasilia, which likely belonged to metalsmiths or merchants, uh, we have a blowpipe tip from Vulnus, uh, which suggests that metal production continued on the north coast through the early Cypriot period. And for the Middle Bronze Age, Andreas's compositional analyses show, amongst many other things, the targeted 
use of alloys for specific art artifact types at Lapithos. This is most obvious in the case of toggle pins, 76% of which are tin alloys. Given that there's no mechanical reason to use tin for these objects, this presumably means uh, it reflects the use of tin for aesthetic purposes to achieve a golden surface colour. Pin types also show considerable diversity. Um, there are a significant number which are imports or emulate non-Cypriot types, as we've seen, and there's an indigenous form. Uh, uh, there are indigenous forms which emerge uh, during the Middle Bronze Age and are found almost exclusively at Lapithos, notably these mushroom-headed pins. We also have pins with traces of silver, with metal bands, and with engraved decoration. So while metal tools and weapons remain fairly conservative, this is not the case with pins, which show diversity, experimentation, elaboration, and the influence of foreign forms. In other words, I think this suggests that there was, there was significant uh, metalworking expertise at Lapithos in the Middle Bronze Age. Much by no means all of this is speculative, uh, but if we can, I think, envisage uh, knowledge of the location, type, and quality of available copper sources in the early second millennium, and a seaborne trade in which the north coast of Cyprus had been involved since the mid-third millennium, then none of this, in my view, is counterintuitive. And we can include Cyprus in a maritime interaction sphere together with the northern Levant and southern Anatolia. Indeed, for this trade network to have ignored or only passively engaged with Cyprus, as much modern scholarship does, would seem equally, if not more, in need of explanation. And so to the second of Bernard's, uh, the second issue, the issue of timing. When in the Middle Bronze Age do we see a significant number of imports at Lapithos, and when does metal start to appear in large quantities in the tombs? Uh, we have five main sets of data from Lapithos, in total 168 tombs, of, only, uh, of which only 43 uh, have uh, been fully published, uh, seven, 18 of them only last year, and I'm working my way through the 1931 tombs. So there are problems of publication and comparability which make this significantly more difficult to answer than it should be. I tried doing this in various ways. Here I used the presence absence of white painted ware, which begins in Middle Cypriot I in the 1927 tombs as a proxy for tomb passing. This confirms the increase of metal, shown here in, in gold, from the early to the Middle Cypriot, but it's not fine scale enough to show change within the Middle Cypriot. If we divide the published tomb assemblages from 1917 and 1927 into those with only red polished, with red polished and white painted two, with red polished, white painted two, and later classes of white painted ware, again using these as a proxy for final tomb dates, then the relative percentage of metal looks pretty steady across the middle Cypriot. In contrast to the 1931 data, where using the chronological groups identified by Ellen Hersher in her PhD, it looks like there's a big jump in metal deposition as a relative percentage of assemblages in middle Cypriot two to three. But flattening the data in this way um, is not really getting us anywhere, and it's also masking inequality in the distribution of metal across the cemetery. If we look instead at individual tombs, we can see both a significant growth in metal deposition and an uneven distribution through time. This is the combined uh, data from 1927 and 1931 across three chronological periods, and the data from the 1917 tombs across two of the same chronological periods. The 1917 assemblages show the same growth and uneven distribution, but don't include any of the really metal-rich tombs. And this slide uh, shows the data from the 1913 tombs, um, some of which in the later group were, were extremely rich in metal. In fact, 10 Middle Cypriot tombs with 40 or more metal objects account for 73% of all the metal recovered. And if we move that bar higher to tombs with over 100 metal objects, three tombs account for 36.5% of all metal. Same is true of the 1927 and 1931 tombs, where according to Stuart Sweeney, less than 10% of the chambers produce 64% of the metal. So there's a far higher incidence of metal in tombs at Lapithos than elsewhere on the island in the Middle Bronze Age, a very significant increase in metal deposition from the early to the Middle Bronze Age, and an uneven, uneven distribution of metal in the tombs, both in the early and the Middle Bronze Age, but particularly in the Middle Bronze Age. But we still need to look at what's happening within the Middle Cypriot and the correlation, if any, between metal and imports. If we look at the tombs which contain imports within two broad overlapping chronological periods within the Middle Cypriot, it would appear that there is a correlation between the quantity of metal and the number of imports evident in both Middle Cypriot 1 to 2 and Middle Cypriot 2 to 3. 
there is also, interestingly, a change in the nature of the imports from Middle Cypriot 1 to 2 to Middle Cypriot 2 to 3. Gold and silver and faience, which is dark blue here, are more common in the Middle Cypriot 1 to 2 tombs, while there is an increase in uh, Middle Cypriot 2 to 3 in the number of lead spiral rings. Now, all this is very preliminary, and there are lots of problems. I've not yet looked at all the 1913 tombs. Some of the imports and much of the metal may have been in use in the first period and deposited in the second. There are indications in some tombs of the hoarding or caching of metal, and the identification of imports is, as we've seen, problematic in some cases. But even taking, for the moment, a minimalist position, as I have here on what is and is not an import, we can certainly see that imports are present already in Middle Cypriot 1 to 2 and that they're associated with metal-rich tombs. There's a very considerable growth in the amount of metal uh, deposited and in the number of tombs which are rich in metal and a change in the nature of the imports, but not, it would appear, an increase in the number of imports over time, although this is where identification becomes most problematic because if some of those uh, toggle pins, for example, are imports, not copies, then they would come into the later uh, tomb group. So what is the answer to the second of Bernard's questions? There are tombs in each period that are larger and architecturally more complex than the norm, with more people, that is more emphasis on kin group affiliation, more metal and more imports or locally produced exotic objects like plank figures, and higher levels in symbolic ritual activity. From tombs like uh, 201A in Middle Cypriot 1 to tomb 204 in Middle Cypriot 2 and 3. The connection between metal wealth and imports would appear to be present from at least Middle Cypriot 1 and to build over time. Metal wealth is greatest in Middle Cypriot 2 to 3, but it starts well before this, and the link between metal and imports may in fact be more evident in Middle Cypriot 1 to 2 than in Middle Cypriot 2 to 3. Keswani has argued that differences in wealth in cemeteries like that at Lapithos are quantitative and graded, not qualitative and discontinuous. That is, people with more wealth were buried with more metal and more pots, not different metal and different pots. And that it's only with the advent of the Late Bronze Age that exclusive complements of higher order prestige goods and objects of higher iconographic content become apparent in mortuary assemblages, symbolically differentiating elites from non-elites and signifying the development of a stratified social order. But does the evidence from Lapithos suggest a, a community in which status and wealth were expressed only in quantitative terms or already quanti qualitatively in Middle Cypriot 1 to 2? There are tombs with assemblages which indicate differential access to exotica, including imports from Middle Cypriot 1 onwards at Lapithos, gold and silver jewellery, plank figures, objects of high aesthetic value, which in turn suggest the existence of the kind of differences that if we were talking about the Late Bronze Age, would I suspect be viewed as evidence of at least the emerging social hierarchy. The majority of imports are also what I like to call look at me objects necklaces, rings, grooming equipment, dress pins, objects which enhance individual visibility and suggest exclusionary expressions of social prestige. So some people at Lapithos were distinguishing themselves by wearing foreign objects or adopting foreign fashions. And we should note the connection between dress pins and textiles, in this case perhaps in the form of burial shrouds, and the likelihood that textiles were being traded along with metals. If such rare objects actively constitute and transform social relations, they are likely to have had a very significant import, impact within the community which buried its dead at Frisi Tubaba, a point which uh, Sturt has made recently also. Like Bernard, the people of Lapithos were not interested in pottery. <laughs> Sorry. Um, where we find uh, uh, pots, um, foreign pots, they are likely to have been traders' items, not traded items. What they were interested in was conspicuous funerary displays and specific forms of adornment, at least of the dead. This implies not just access to imports, but a familiarity with what these objects signified in their Anatolian and Levantine contexts, and thus again a greater external connectivity for some people in Middle Bronze Age Cyprus than I think we have previously allowed. Briefly, I think we need to add the, the large number of weapons found at Lapithos to this scenario. If we just take the spearheads, of which there are well over 200, they also, not surprisingly, correlate with the metal-rich tombs, particularly in Middle Cypriot 2 to 3, and leave little doubt that some group at, groups at Lapithos, uh, in particular the high metal-consuming groups, had the capacity to raid, trade and protect their wealth, or and perhaps engage in hunting, uh, as another aspect of their exclusionary identity. 
How this North Coast scenario, which is predicated on an involvement in an east-west trade in metals along the southern Anatolian coast, fits with the entry of Cyprus into trading networks operating between eastern Cyprus, the Levant and Egypt in late Middle Cypriot III and late Cypriot I, is certainly a question of interest. Did one maritime interaction sphere replace the other, or were they in part contemporary but separate trading zones involving a different set of producers and products, metal versus oil and or perfume and their pottery containers, or and new markets for copper? Did the takeoff of Cypriot pottery overseas happen before or after the demise of Lapithos? This is not an easy question to answer because the Cypriot fabrics found beyond Cyprus come almost exclusively from the east of the island and are not present at Lapithos, making it very difficult to assess their relative chronology. It seems clear to, clear to me nonetheless that Lapithos's external links began well before and likely almost entirely predate the appearance of Cypriot pottery in Egypt and the Levant. My attempt to refine my position has not led to any downgrading of my perceived maximalism, which I suspect will come as no surprise to Bernard. I would continue to suggest that Cyprus was actively involved, successively during the Bronze Age, if not in part contemporaneously, in several Eastern Mediterranean regional interaction spheres, with the southern coast of Anatolia and related areas at the beginning of the Early Bronze Age and again during the Middle Bronze Age, and with Egypt and the Levantine coastal ports from late Middle Cypriot III into the Late Bronze Age. In regard to the first two, we are in a difficult position because those parts of the island most involved in this interaction have been inaccessible since 1974, and we have no settlement data at all from this area. But the 1913 Lapithos material, which is now coming back into the light, is giving us new data to work with and offering something beyond speculation. The singularity of the North Coast in the Early and Middle Bronze Age is undeniable. And while the still unknown settlements at Ayaparaskevi and Denya may well have been similar in size and complexity, I don't think we can use any of the excavated settlements like Marquis and Alhambra as a proxy for these much larger aggregated Middle Cypriot sites. If my position uh, is maximalist, may I remind you finally that we have been here before. Jim Stewart, another Australian, went so far as to propose that Lapithos may have been the head of a centralised state on the north coast, surely an ultra-maximalist position. It was Catling who first suggested that Lapithos was a manufacturing centre for metal goods, and both Sturt and Eddie Peltenberg argued in, the, in the, the early 1990s for the emergence of hereditary elites on the north coast in the prehistoric Bronze Age. Indeed, Sturt is now again talking about apex sites on the north coast, arguing that our lack of settlement evidence should serve as a warning against suggestions that socially complex communities did not exist in this region by Middle Cypriot 1 to 2. I am not the only maximalist in the room. <laughs> Thus encouraged, with Bert's help, Bernard's help, I will continue to hold and refine my maximalist position. Thank you very much. <laughs> an Australian too, that doesn't, doesn't quite work. Uh, I just want to make a couple of mild comments. Um, uh, first of all, uh, as, as you note, as you mentioned, and as I've argued uh, many times, you, you you cannot use as your chart with showing the Sophie Gale's 2018 article, you can't argue about the origin of Cypriot ores. You can only argue about what, about uh, non-sourcing. All the arguments you make in that respect um, are valid and acceptable. Um, this is um, a minor point. Um, as is my concern about uh, portable XRF. Uh, I, I don't want to be a Luddite, but I'd also like to see at least a significant sample of that material analyzed uh, uh, with a technique like 
NAA or whatever that looks at, in more depth at, at, at the chemical uh, content. And finally, um, as I must point out again and again to you and Sturt and everyone else, it's very difficult when you look at the difference between the size of settlements uh, that exist in from Middle Cypriot three, Late Cypriot one onward, compared to the size of settlements that exist in the Middle Cypriot period. Uh, we simply don't have that evidence yet. And much as I would like to think that a place like Lapithos must have some sort of significant port or settlement associated with it, we just don't have that evidence. And um, uh, so, so uh, in that, in those respects, I, I must remain a minim minimal. One more question. Anybody else to ask something? Okay, I'd like to thank Jenny very much for speaking. And the good news is, it's only one more paper to a coffee break in this uh, evening session. <laughs> Okay, the next paper is by a former director of the Department of Antiquities and somebody who got to know Bernard um, extensively when he began his fieldwork on the island. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Sophocles Hadjisavis. He's going to talk about Mathiatis Mavrivuni, a minor sanctuary. Thank you, Sophocles. Thank you. Thank you, sir. As I have in many other occasions uh, expressed my appreciation to Bernard's work, work on Cypriot archaeology and uh, special thanks uh, to him for his help in my last volume on Alasa, uh, allow me to take you directly to Mathiatis. Sorry. In, in May 1983, members of the Cyprus National Guard engaged in road construction, removed most of a large slug heap known as Mavrovuni, located between the village of Mathiatis and the South Mathiatis mine. During the course of their work, quantities of limestone sculptures were unearthed, mixed together with slag. The Department of Antiquities was subsequently informed and became involved in the operation. On June 13 of the same year, I was authorized to undertake a five-day rescue excavation at the site. In conjunction with this work, a surface survey, uh, survey was carried out across a small area surrounding the slag heap. This rescue operation resulted in the discovery of large numbers of limestone sculptures, terracotta figurines, and pottery types familiar with sanctuaries. The work confirmed that the sanctuary at Mavrovuni had been entirely destroyed at an earlier stage and that the slag heap represented a dumping of greatly disturbed material. The scope of this presentation is to provide some further information on the history of Mathiadis region and its relation to mining, which became the focus of lively discussion quite uh, recently after an attempt to reopen the Strongylos mine. As I was uh, directly involved with the inclusion of the ancient mining sites of Cyprus on the tentative list of the World uh, Heritage List of UNESCO, my interest on the site was resumed last year and led me to revisit the, the site. Any consideration of the site and its finds inevitably leads to a discussion of the regional economy and the critical role of this area in Cypriot copper production. This topic was selected as the most appropriate for the present conference as it is in many ways related to Bernard Knapp, whose long engagement in the subject of mining and religion is reflected in his influential 1986 volume entitled Copper Production and Divine Protection. This preliminary investigation is presented here for the first time, many years after its completion, as my initial intention was to proceed directly with the final publication of the site in collaboration with Professor John Connolly a project which is currently resumed. Mathiadis is a small village placed in the eastern foothills of the Trodos Massif, some 22 kilometers south of Nicosia. Along with the neighboring villages of Catalondas and Lithrodondas, Mathiadis owes 
its very existence to its location in close proximity to a very significant source of ore. Indeed, the entire region lies within the lower pillow lava series of the trudosophiolite, rich in sulfide deposits necessary for the production of copper. Within the fields of Cypriot archaeology and archaeometallurgy, Mathiatis is mostly known as the fine spot of one of the only three intact oxide ingots ever found in Cyprus. The ingot is part of the Mathiatis hoard discovered by the Cyprus Mines Corporation during the course of prospecting at North Mathiatis Mine in 1936. Habitation in the area is confirmed from at least the Late Bronze Age owing to accidental discoveries. In 1988, a tomb dating to the Late Bronze Age II period was excavated by the Department of Antiquities and published by Maria Hajigosti in 1991. An impressive relief of the Hellenistic period showing a bearded head of Dionysos has long been known to come from Mathiadis, though its exact find spot has never been mentioned in the archaeological literature. In January 1995, I under took a search in the village for any information related to the discovery of this important piece. Several elderly people were questioned and all agreed that the sculpture was found at the locality of Visageri, due west of the North Mathiadis mine. The late Panagis Haralambus and Pavlos Ma Mikhail from the village of Mathiadis, aged 80 at the time, described in detail the circumstances of the discovery, uh, though they could not recall the exact year in which it was made. According to Banagis, a farmer named Kyriakos Christofi noticed a white slab projecting from the dark colored pillow lavas in a field by a road near his farm. While he was removing the stray stone, a policeman on horseback happened by and asked him to flip it over. The image of Dionysos immediately appeared in the light. The relief was taken to the police station at Lithrodondas and eventually sent, to, sent on to Nicosia. According to the villagers, some rectangular basins thought to, be, to belong to a tannery were located near the fine spot of the Dionysos relief. Today, the plaster lining of two rectangular basins most, most likely part of a reservoir or a wine press can be seen projecting out of the earth in the small plot of uncultivated land from which the relief was supposedly recovered. The surrounding area is rich in ancient finds. In adjacent cultivated fields, roof tiles and Roman pottery lie scattered across the surface. To the west, a rocky hill is cut by a number of chamber tombs looted long ago. To this, and very close to the North Mathiadis mine, is yet another hill, this one called Cochinandonis, probably from the Gossans, where tombs of classical through Roman date have been discovered and listed in the Cyprus Archaeological Survey. On various occasions over the years, coins of Hellenistic and Roman date from unspecified sites in the Mathiadis region have been presented to the Cyprus Museum. Mavrovuni is a popular toponym on the island. In the complete gazetteer of Cyprus, it is mentioned at least 28 times. It literally means Black Hill or Black Mountain and is generally assigned to hills covered with slack or to slack heaps alone. The slack heap at Mathiadis is located in close proximity to the Mathiadis South Mine, as is the standard practice for copper production in Cyprus. Fuel for the smelting operations you would have been provided by the pine forest surrounding the mine and the production site. The slug waste from uh, these operations can be seen scattered in a large area adjacent to the South Mathiadis mine, as well as in the fields near Mavrovuni. According to information gathered from elderly people of the village, about 80% of the original slug was still at the site up until the 1950s. During the 60s, this percentage decreased to about 70%. Most of this slag was removed for use in road construction and for the building of the Lanidion Stadium in Limassol in 1969. During the 1970s and 80s, a good bit of the remaining slag was re uh, removed by the National Guard 
and crews involved in road construction. Accidental discoveries from the side of Mavrovuni include bronze coins of T Ptolemaic, Roman, and Byzantine date purchased by the Cyprus Museum in 1951. Eluded tomb at Mavrovuni produced two white painted three jugs and one white painted three amphora, purchased again by the Cyprus Museum in 1962, as well as other plain white war vessels. In the same year, a limestone male head from Mavrovuni was also purchased by the Cyprus Museum. Today, a large number of looted chamber tombs can be seen cut into the igneous rocky hill just west of the site. Modern open cast prospecting at the locality of Strongylos, also known, known as the South Mathiadis Mine, has led to the discovery of a number of adits in the walls of the open pit, thought to be ancient, though today their antiquity is disputed. Artifacts reportedly found during prospecting at the site provide evidence for the antiquity of the mine. In 1936, Hellenistic shares were retrieved and later a carbonized piece of rope from the galleries, either from Mathiadis or Cambia mines, was presented to the Cyprus Museum. In 1938, some pieces of timber were discovered and given over to the department. The precise dating of the adits is made difficult by the lack of diagnostic material. Radiocarbon dates taken from sites throughout the Trodos indicate, however, that most of the ancient galleries were engineered in pre-Roman times. In 1995, the archaeological survey undertaken by the Almiraz excavation team in the Shah Mathiadis Aya Varvara region led to the discovery of one fragment of furnace lining with adhering to air. This find from the southern outskirts of the South Mathiadis mine led to an intensive survey of the area adjacent to the recent prospecting. Two well-preserved furnaces were discovered at the edge of one of the terraces of the modern mine, most probably exposed thanks to heavy rains in the previous year. The first furnace seems to have been used as a roasting pit. The second furnace was found filled with the last charge still in situ, indicating that it served as a smelting chamber, indeed one of the very few thus far discovered on Cyprus. Those were published by Fastnight. Charcoal from the smelting furnace has been dated to the Cibro Archaic II period. This date fits well with the dating of the first phase of activity at the sanctuary of Mavrovuni. Archaeobotanical analysis has shown that most of the charcoal was made from olive wood. The site. Mavrovuni is a low eminence located some 1,200 meters southeast of Mathiadis village at an altitude of 390 meters above sea level. The locality name is applied to a much greater area than the slag heap itself. The most prominent feature in the area of Mavrovini is a rocky hill rising to a summit of 40 meters, which seems to have served as the ancient necropolis. The gentle eastern slopes of this hill were covered by slag until the 1960s, but now only stray bits of slag are scattered across the cultivated fields below. The hill is situated to the west of the track joining the village with South Mathiadis mine, some 700 meters to the southeast of the Mavrovuni slag heap. The remains of the sanctuary were located east of this track. A perennial, a perennial spring lies less than 50 meters to the north of the, the, of the remains and very close to the track. It could well provide one of the motivating factors for the establishment of the sanctuary at this location. To the east of the sanctuary flows a stream called Arcachindis Vasilus. A number of old pine trees surround the slag heap and the sanctuary area. Indeed, what little slag remains at the site is concentrated close to the pines which seem to have prevented any removal from the site. Arable land a good water source and sufficient fu fuel supply seem to have created an ideal location for ancient habitation, particularly for a community whose local economy was based on agriculture and metallurgy. The settlement site remains unknown. 
intensive land use and cultivation over the years has probably destroyed any hope of uncovering intact architectural remains. Shirts scattered over the cultivated fields surrounding Mavrovini suggest that the settlement may have been in this area not far from the sanctuary itself. The excavation now. Following my report on the finds at Mavrovuni to the Director of Antiquities, funds were allocated for a five days rescue work at the site. The area previously occupied by the slug heap presented a sad picture. Mounds of earth mixed with slug and broken artifacts lie at the side of the track. In a nearby field, a number of dress stones and sculptures were set aside awaiting retrieval by the National Guard. A small stepped column base, most probably from the later building phases of the sanctuary, lay among the finds. The work began with a systematic search through the heaps of disturbed earth to recover any sculptures or other artifacts left by the soldiers. Following this effort, the disturbed dam was removed and a grid of six three by three squares was laid down for systematic excavation. In the two easternmost squares, excavated, excavation exposed no architectural remains, but large quantities of pottery and sculptures at a depth of 60 centimeters beneath the surface. In this southeastern square, at a depth of 40 centimeters, a deep ashy layer was found under large pieces of slug. The ashy layer rested on a hard packed surface that gently sloped to the north. Extension of the excavated area to the west resulted in the discovery of more pottery and terracotta figurines. In the western section of square four, a small pit was excavated to a depth of 50 centimeters. Attached to it was a shallow depression. This pit contained some plain white shirts within clean earth and stained by slag. Excavation of square three led to the discovery of wall foundations in a poor state of preservation covered by a layer of slag. The walls range in thickness from 40 to 50 centimeters and were built of pebbles and stones, most likely taken from the nearby mine and the stream. Further to the west, outside the grid and very close to the track, more remains were found. No proper floor levels could be associated with these walls, but only the natural hard packed earthen surface sloping gently northwards seems to relate to the foundations. Near the scanty remains found close to the track and opposite the uh, construction resembling an entrance, a, a shallow trough was unearthed. At the backside of the trough, an overturned saddle gear was found, perhaps belonging to a grinding installation. All these files hint to the presence of uh, smelting installations. In addition to the find uh, to the finds excavated by the Department of Antiquities, a small number of limestone sculptures, including a life-size male head, were turned over to the department by soldiers engaged in the initial removal of the slag material. The head in the middle was given to us by the National Guard. The others were, were retrieved from the village. At the same time with the excavations, a search was undertaken throughout the village for information about sculptures that had been removed from the site over the years. This resulted in the presentation by village of a small number of limestone sculptures, including life-size life statues. The sanctuary at Mavrovuni seems to have functioned uh, from the Cypro archaic through the Hellenistic period a particularly active period for the mining operations. Certain finds, however, are much earlier in date and point to even more ancient activity at the site. A groove stone hammer, number 250 on the slide, has close parallels with a surface find from the middle Cypriot side of Alhambra Mutes. A third example is part of the well-known Mathiadis Hort attributed to the 12th century BC. Stone hammers of this type are also known from Rio Tinto in Spain, but also from the Caucasus region, Caucasus, 
present-day Georgia dated to the 12th and 11th centuries BC. The charcoal shovel found at the site of Mavrovuni could easily be attributed to the late Bronze Age on the basis of its technique of manufacture, including its looped uh, handle. It fits well with the group described by Catling and dated to the 12th century BC. A mere comparison of the metal composition with that of the miniature box uh, found at the same uh, site is quite informative. You see the first, the first one is uh, bronze, the other is, uh, we, we can call it copper, tin, and lead. Uh, Andreas Karalambus analyzed the two objects. As skull places in Cyprus often demonstrate a very long sequence, frequently stretching from the Bronze Age right down to the Hellenistic period, it would not be surprising if the Mavrovuni sanctuary enjoyed an equally long period of activity. An assemblage of 136 limestone votives was recovered from the sanctuary, including 130 sculptures, three bases, and two small altars. The majority of the sculpture depicts male figures standing drapped and red adult votaries together with a much smaller number of figures, uh, sorry, of female figures. Some youths wearing flat caps and a few so-called temple boys. As for divinities, the most represented is Pan, followed by Heracles and Apollo. Some 62 Dragota figurines were also recovered, the great majority of which depict uh, horses and horse riders. The votives dedicated uh, at Mathiadis Mavrovuni were found in a very fragmentary state of preservation. Heads, hands, feet, torsos, all broken away from the full statues. The material dates stylistically from the archaic into the Hellenistic period. The god uh, Pan dominates as the most abundantly depicted divinity and can be seen in 17 fragments. Not everything is shown here, of course. These include four heads, seven torsos, and six pairs of legs. Pan is shown with short horns, pointed ears, long wavy hair, a nude body with a thephalic member, fleshly abdomen, and thick legs. He wears a mantle or goat skin tied around his neck and thrown back over his shoulders and carries a shepherd's crook at his right side and the salpings of pan or pan pipes in his left hand. Interestingly, one can track the worship of pan along the overland routes from the, uh, from the inland mines of the Trudos to the smelting sites leading down to the Mesauria and on to the eastern ports through which copper was exported to destinations all across the Mediterranean. From Tamasos to Mathiadis Mavrovuni, Idalion, Podamnia, Golgoi, and Athienu, where over 30 images of Pan were, uh, were unearthed, to Levconico, Pila, and Kidion, this popular divinity was represented in limestone votive statuary across broad networks on ancient Cyprus. Heracles is the next most popular divinity at Mathiadis Mavrovuni, attested in three fragments. A head and two very thick uh, carved legs. The head of the hero is covered by a lion's skin, showing the beast killed in Heracles' first labor. Two red male uh, heads may be identified as showing the god Apollo, and one sculpture seems to show his sister Artemis preserving only her legs beneath a short tunic. Among the representations of worshippers, 26 male torsos have been recovered. Six of these are shown holding birds in their hands and two hold musical instruments. Heads broken from these male figures are abandoned. Ten show red men and boys Three are shown wearing uh, uh, the rosette crown, and one wears a conical or levantine uh, cap. Five sculptures show boys wearing the flat uh, cap or kosia, the Ptolemaic uh, hat, and one figure is shown wearing an Egyptian kilt. 
just 11 female figures have been recovered. A total of 14 hands and arms have been found, some holding jugs, others shown uh, clutching lustral branches and incest boxes. 17 feet and leg fragments have also been recovered. Among the Terragoda figurines, horses dominate and are represented in 40 fragments along with seven horse riders, three four horse chariots and two chariot fragments. The pottery types include 30 jugglers, one lamb and two bowls. The tiny jugglers are typical offerings in Cypriot sanctuaries, having a long tradition initiated in the late Bronze Age as documented in the sanctuary of Athienu Pambularin di Skugunigas. The copper production site at Athienu is closely associated with the sanctuary situated along the copper route joining Trodos with Kidion. Material recovered from the Mount of Mavrouni was found in a greatly disturbed state. Most of the pottery and some of the terracotta figurines were found in the very deep levels resting on bedrock. Remains of walls uncovered during our excavation and residual slack scattered over the blackened surface were unintentionally removed by soldiers soon after the rescue operation. Thus the lack of uh, professional drawings. The only drawings we have is in, in my diary, done by hand without any measurements. Interpretation of the architectural remains at the site is extremely difficult. The circumstances of the chance discovery, the very small area systematically excavated, the poor state of preservation of the remains, and the destruction of the site immediately following excavation all contribute to the difficult challenge of interpretation. The most serious uh, shortcoming is the lack of any stratigraphy, which excludes a priori any attempt towards the reconstruction of the history of the site. The succession of chronological periods for the architectural remains and the re relationship uh, of these remains to the slack deposition are unknown. So too is the history of the smelting installations. Based on the available evidence, we could tentatively suggest the presence of a copper smelting uh, site at Mavrovuni. On the other hand, the limestone and terracotta sculptures and the ceramic sequence uh, provide tangible evidence for the existence of a sanctuary that functioned from the archaic through the Hellenistic period is not without uh, reason to assume that those engaged in mining and smelting activities worship at the nearby sanctuary, which uh, even have been instituted to serve their needs. Thank you. I think the operation is uh, halted now. They, they don't proceed. I was informed that these individuals, they want to proceed with the explanation of the villages. Thank you. Yes, that's what I'm telling. The villages, though. It's poetic. It's poetic. It's the spoil heaps, it's just the, yes, the modern spoil heaps, but of course the, yes. Any other comments, observations comments or other observations? This is great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we now have a coffee break. The coffee is upstairs. You are forbidden to bring coffee drinks in the library. So coffee is upstairs or outside is, the, I guess, your option if you'd like to. Or the veranda. Back in 30 minutes. Thank you.